Welcome to People and Profit. I'm Yuka Huaye. Coming up, safeguarding human rights or more red tape as EU nations are still divided over key new legislation on supply chain due diligence. We'll discuss what it will mean for companies and consumers. As West Africa's cacao harvest season draws to a close, many farmers are desperate as bad weather and plant diseases have destroyed their crops, pushing global cocoa prices to record levels. A solution to labour shortage among a shrinking, ageing population. Delivery robots are being tested on the streets of Tokyo after the Japanese government changed traffic laws. It's a law meant to defend human rights and protect the planet by requiring large companies to check if their supply chains use child or forced labour or cause environmental damage and to prevent and mitigate abuses and publicly communicate on due diligence. But two years since it was first introduced, negotiations for the European Union's Corporate Sustainability Due Diligence Directive, or CSDDD, have been anything but smooth. Initially, they were designed to apply to large companies with more than 500 employees and 150 million euros in net turnover. But as talks stalled amid opposition from countries like France, Germany and Italy, the text has been watered down. Well, for more, let's bring in Abby Morris, CEO of Compare Ethics, an environmental, social and governance compliance platform. Abby, thanks for joining us. Thank you for having me. Now, the collapse of the Rana Plaza garment factory in Bangladesh 11 years ago revealed the poor working conditions endured by people serving the global fast fashion industry. What were the lessons learned and has consumer and corporate behaviour changed since then? Sadly, corporate behaviour has changed somewhat, but not to the extent that we need in order to protect the planet and actually be responsible businesses. And this is why the wider EU Green, Bill, Green Deal has been so ambitious in wanting to protect workers across the value chain and protect the environment. Now, CSDDD is a, a major part, an important part of that Green Deal. It's a law that aims to step up uh, co companies' accountability for potential human rights and environmental violations. So why has it so controversial in its negotiations so far? I think what's happened over the past week has really been a breakdown around the role of SMEs, particularly because even if we apply this new regulation specifically to the largest 1,000 companies, there's still a lot of SMEs in the value chain. But the thing is, this needs to happen. We need to protect the environment and workers if we want to be responsible businesses. Is. So I think this is part of a process that needs to land and everyone needs to find the political will over the next week to make this a reality. And indeed, uh, perhaps one of the big surprises was France, which actually became the first EU nation to adopt national comprehensive due diligence uh, legislation in, uh, in, on the continent back in 2017. Uh, yet it's been working to reduce the scope of this directive, CSDDD. And why, as you mentioned, has there been a lot of backlash from smaller companies? Yes, I think that there's obviously a big, very loud voice on this issue, but I think we're missing the opportunity here. This doesn't have to be a compliance burden. We're typically seeing that both investors and consumers are increasingly asking corporates and businesses to better communicate their progress. In fact, we're also seeing that over the last five years, 8% increase on profits for companies that are accurately disclosing sustainability. So I think that we don't need to be short-sighted. We just need to get the deal done. So there are benefits for companies, for corporations, big and small? Oh, yes. I mean, also, in an era of AI, this doesn't need to be a compliance burden. We can actually take something that's a very manual task, like due diligence and compliance, and automate it. So let's like not limit ourselves to what has been and be proactive of looking at what is the power of the opportunity? We can actually lower the cost through technology and we can communicate to our investors and consumers with confidence that we're doing the right thing. This is, has to happen now. It's been too long. Many corporations, though, many large corporations especially, have already been carrying out due diligence. For example, global car companies or fast fashion retailers regularly make statements about their supply chain verification procedures. Will the EU directive mean additional uh, additional red tape? 
So I think that as part of the wider Green Deal, all of these different regulations are created specifically to fit together. This is one piece, but there's also the Green Claims Directive, which passed provisionally yesterday. And that is not about red tape. This is around the businesses who are truly sustainable and say that they are responsible. This is a framework for action. So I don't think businesses should be fearing this as red tape. You can keep those costs low with technology. You should be, if you're a good, responsible business, be welcoming this because this is a way that you can entice good access to capital and good customer bases through actually demonstrating the action that you say you're doing. This is allowing you to walk the walk and talk the talk. And has the watered down version of the directive, uh, will it go far enough, do you think? Um, well, it remains to be seen where we land. But ultimately, when companies are faced with penalties potentially of 5% of global turnover just for this um, directive alone, and then with the EU Green uh, Claims Directive also at 4% of global turnover for non-compliance, I think that it is very clear on the direction of travel that companies should be uh, looking to invest in now to get ahead of the grain. Now, your company helps clients gain insight into their, into their sustainability risks uh, through data. What are you hearing from your clients? I think from a lot of our clients, they want clarity on what data is required. I think a lot of companies today understand this is the direction of travel, at least the leaders within uh, the spaces that we work in, particularly within the fashion sector. But I think we're still looking for good clarity on what those business requirements look like so that we can help them actually automate that process and make this as seamless of a transition as possible. And what kind of impact will this kind of uh, law have on consumers? Oh, it just provides clarity, doesn't it? It enables us to really understand the impact and the provenance of our products. And I think ultimately, as all consumers, we want to know that we're back in companies in, in, that we trust. And this comes back to trust. And I think that if you're a business right now and you're not able to be demonstrating that trust, I think that you're in a very sticky position. So for consumers right now, it's a really key enabler for us to get the right information that we want. Oh, Abby Morris from Compare Ethics, thank you so much. Thanks for your time. Now, global cocoa prices have surged to record highs in recent weeks as the main cacao harvest season is almost coming to an end. In Ivory Coast and Ghana, which together account for more than half of the global cacao supply, farmers have been facing a crisis as plant diseases have ruined their crop their spread facilitated by months of wet weather. Brian Quinn reports. As the cacao growing season draws to a close, the mood among farmers here in Ivory Coast isn't sweet. Instead, they're facing a bitter new reality, as months of soggy conditions have left their plantations facing maladies like fungal black pod disease that are ruining their crops. When the disease comes to take over your fields, you can lose everything. When it blackens your cacao, the pods lose weight. They rot before they can be picked. Cacao is the crucial raw ingredient in chocolate. Ivory Coast and its neighbor Ghana together produce more than two-thirds of the world's supply. From October to March, Ivory Coast farmers shipped 1.2 million metric tons to port, down 30 percent from the previous year. The falling supply is driving wholesale prices up, but not enough for farmers who are demanding government intervention. We are telling our representatives that if they don't take action in the next few days, we are prepared to go on strike to get the government to sit down with us and make a plan. The global chocolate market was worth $45 billion in 2022. That's expected to hit $68 billion by 2029. Climate change and disease, though, are not the only challenges facing cacao production in West Africa. Cacao farming has been blamed for rapid deforestation. Ivory Coast has lost some 90% of its dense forests since the 1950s. Roughly half of Ivory Coast's cacao is exported to Europe. But starting in 2025, new EU regulations mean that products tied to deforestation will be banned in the bloc. Japan continues to grapple with a shrinking and ageing population. Last year, fewer than 760,000 babies were born, a record low, while more than double that figure, nearly 1.6 million people, died. 
As part of an effort to address demographic labour shortages, the government recently tweaked its traffic laws to allow self-driving robots on public roads. Uber Eats has launched an AI-based delivery service in selected areas of Tokyo. Vedika Baho has the story. Takeaway in Tokyo just got a makeover. Residents in one district of Japan's capital will be receiving their food orders by self-driving robot. In a collaboration by Uber Eats Japan, Mitsubishi and delivery robotics firm Kartkin. According to the US-based food app, current drivers need not worry as the robots would only complement human service. The robots will be another form of delivery method and would be suitable for... So again, we are testing, we are finding out in which areas that will be suitable. Eventually tall buildings too can be useful because it may integrate with the elevators and may be able to deliver up to offices. The robot can move 5.4 kilometers per hour and uses sensors to avoid collisions with people and obstacles. And back at its HQ, its movements are monitored by a human operator on standby. As well as being useful during bad weather and less risk of human contamination, residents pointed to Japan's aging population as reasons why robots could be beneficial. Japan has an aging and dwindling population, with the labor shortage being serious. So this is a very good idea for Japan. Our society's aging and the lack of workers is a severe issue here. So this kind of trial will solve those issues. I feel that this can be effective not only in the city, but also in less populated rural areas. Facing growing labor shortages, Japan changed its traffic laws last year to allow delivery robots on public streets. The birth rate is currently the lowest it's ever been, and its 125 million population is predicted to fall by 30 percent to 87 million by 2070. That's all for this edition of People in Profit. Remember, you can watch this and all our previous episodes on the France24.com website or listen to them wherever you get your podcasts. If you have any questions or comments, you can also reach out to us on social media. Thanks for watching and stay tuned to France24 if you can. There's more world news coming up.